Фундация Конрад Аденауер е германска политическа фундация, изповядваща християн-демократическите ценности. Тя работи от 65 години за мир, либерална демокрация, правова държава, правата на човека и социално пазарно стопанство. Седалището и академията на фундацията се намират в Берлин. Освен това, тя присъства с образователни форуми в 18 германски града. В Германия тя има 560 сътрудници. Фундация Конрад Аденауер има също така дългогодишен международен опит. Тя работи в 120 страни и има 107 бюра в чужбина на всички континенти с общо 737 сътрудници. Фундацията открива бюрото в България през 1994 година и от тогава осъществила многобройни проекти с партньори в страната. В момента бюрото се ръководи от Торстен Гайслер, който казва С нашите български партньори и приятели ни свързват дълго и основано на взаимно доверие и сътрудничество. Заедно работим за укрепване на сътрудничеството в рамките на Европейския съюз и НАТО, за западните ценности, върху които са изградени тези два съюза. Свободата, демокрацията и правовата държава са ориентир за нашите действия и в България. Ние с удоволствие работим в тази страна, която е постигнала толкова много след промяната през 1989 година. Welcome to this discussion on the future challenges of the European Union, organized by the European Council on Foreign Relations, ECFR, and very kindly funded by Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Sofia. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank the Konrad Adenauer Foundation for funding this event, and I would also like to welcome the members of ECFR's um, Foreign Policy Club in Sofia, Club Europe, so I'm very glad that you all could join us here today. This is the fourth event in a series in which we're looking at challenges to the European Union. And I think today we really have an incredibly important discussion ahead of us. We will talk about how Europe will and can really position itself with regard to digital technologies and artificial intelligence in the future. And for me, this whole debate really comes under the headline of digital sovereignty, European digital sovereignty. What does it mean? What is it? How can we achieve it? Um, and what will this look like in the future? Um, my name is Ulrike Franke. I'm a policy fellow at ECFR based in the London office, and I work on new technologies and AI in particular, uh, looking at it from a geopolitical and indeed a military angle, which I don't think we're going to discuss um, a lot here today, uh, but maybe that's of interest to you too. Now, these days, digital sovereignty, new technologies is really on, on many people's minds. And you may have seen it this morning when you opened the newspaper, because we just had the announcement that the French and the Dutch digital ministers, I think they're called differently in, in the two countries, but, but the equivalent of digital ministers had published a position paper on breaking up uh, big tech or at least on regulating big tech and potentially even breaking it up. So there's a discussion there. And of course, we've been discussing and talking a lot about digital taxes, uh, the European cloud, Gaia X. Um, I heard about the European Cloud Federation, uh, which is a new idea, the Digital Services Act. Lots of, of these things have been discussed uh, over the last um, well, year in particular, but also before that. And as you may know, ECFR has been doing quite a lot on the topic um, as well, quite a lot of work. If you go to our website, you can read great um, uh, commentaries and analyses by, by Janka, for instance, on the geopolitical competition in the technological realm. We published over the summer a great essay collection um, entitled Europe's Digital Sovereignty from Rulemaker to Superpower in the Age of US-China Rivalry. So here again, uh, we had some ECFR experts. Um, I myself had an, had an essay in there, but also lots of ECFR council members, other experts really looking at all of the different aspects of this theme from different angles. And so I very much recommend you to, to have a look at this and, and check this out. But we should um, dive right into the discussion. And I'm incredibly uh, happy to welcome this all-star cast here today 
Uh, so we have Dr. Janka Oertl, who is ECFR's Asia Program Director based in the Berlin office. Thank you so much for being with us today, Janka. We have Eva Meidel, who of course is a member of the European Parliament. And importantly for this discussion, she's a member of the, <clears throat> excuse me, she's a member of the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in the Digital Age, which just started its work. And I'm very excited to hear more about this and, and where this is going. And in the past, she also has worked uh, on, on the protection of personal data. So really a great person to talk to us today. And then last but certainly not least, we have Eileen Chivo, who's joining us from Brussels. Also, thank you so much for being with us. She's a senior policy analyst at the Center for Data Innovation. And I've been following Eileen's work for, for quite a long time, and she's very knowledgeable in all things EU and digital. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to listen to her um, in a second. I have to say, I'm afraid we failed this time in, in terms of gender balance. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll excuse us on, on that and, and we can make up for it uh, another time. Two very short notices before we start. Um, the first half hour, so the three interventions by our three speakers will be on the record and indeed recorded. Um, we will put those online, I think, with Bulgarian subtitles as well, so just that you are aware. However, the rest of the discussion, um, the Q&A, uh, I want to bring all of you in very, very soon, will not be recorded. I would recommend to, to consider it as, as, as Chatham House rules. So please feel free to make the points you want to make without fear of being quoted or indeed misquoted um, somewhere. Uh, we'll, we'll do about half an hour, I think, with interventions and then Q&A. So please prepare your questions. And then raise your hand right in the chat. I'll, I'll keep an eye out for, for questions. We really have a great group of people here today, lots of experts. So I want to hear from you, and I'm sure the panelists also want to hear from you. So, so don't, don't hold back on that. All right, I would say we begin the discussion right away. Uh, I want to start with Janka. Uh, again, Janka Ertl, a uh, senior fellow at ECFR, because she has been looking at this whole topic from a geopolitical angle and and i would argue that in europe and indeed in the eu the topic of new technologies and ai so far has been looked at primarily through an economic and and maybe social lens uh, but of course there is a big geopolitical question here there is a china angle which is why we have yanka there is a um a us a transatlantic angle and so so yanka could i ask you to kind of Give us the context here, give us a sense of where the discussion is at and, and what the geopolitical implications of, well, European digital sovereignty um, are. Thank you, Ulrike, and thank you very much to the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the Sofia office for putting this together. It's a great pleasure. And thank you also to Ulrike for moderating because she's the true AI expert. And if it gets too technical, I will just refer back to our moderator and she gets to answer the questions then. Um, as uh, Ulrike has said, um, I'm a China specialist. So this is what my lens is, obviously, through which I look at these uh, at these issues. Uh, and so please bear with me when this has a bit of a China flavor to it. Um, but I think it is uh, important at the moment. I will stick to the first part of the question that we raised in our invitation. How will Europe position itself? This question is becoming increasingly difficult to answer um, because positioning in kind of the, the sense of the word sort of includes a, an idea of agency, of direction, purpose and a strategic perspective. But what it feels like at the moment is different. The reality is always more messy than the theory, but oftentimes over the last few months, it felt more like Europe is being pushed and pulled and kicked around um, and making it harder to define that this is kind of the situation is making it harder to define a clear path forward for Europe. There are two factors that are super relevant for this. And these two factors are the US and China. And I think that's the that's the dimension in which we have to look at this. Um, the dynamic between the two and the deteriorating relationship has an impact on how we how Europe will be able to position itself in this situation. The situation or the, the relationship was deteriorating massively before COVID uh, hit and before the pandemic has kind of turned all of our lives on its head uh, on their head. But um, the pandemic has further enhanced the trend towards politically enforced decoupling, 
and a bifurcation of the technology space. And I think we can definitely say that for now, that this is a trend that will continue. As a China watcher, I'm always making the point, and it's very dear to me and very important, is that decoupling started in China. Uh, and that's really, really, really important to underline and underscore. This is not a Trump invention. This is something that began after the financial crisis um, with the Chinese leadership identifying that um, they need to have an insurance policy against external shocks because it has a destabilizing potential on their internal situation. Um, and I think we, we see that in the policies that are pursued. And I think it's quite an interesting moment to have this conversation as yesterday was the 40 year anniversary of the special economic zone in Shenzhen, um, which is kind of the, the, the picture perfect example of the tech revolution in China. Um, and those 40 years were for a long time um, kind of defined by openness and by integration and by globalization. And for the past years, they are now defined by closing, by protectionism, by renationalization, and by a strong focus on national champions. It was obviously the decoupling tendencies were further exacerbated by the Trump administration and the America first uh, policies. And I think the 5G debate was the first time where we got an idea of how this could like, feel for Europe in the future, how it would feel when we're forced from both sides to make a decision and when it becomes inherently political and where it becomes inherently a security question and not a technical question any longer. And I think that's, uh, we can go into this in the debate longer if we like, if you like, I've been kind of following and uh, debating these issues for the past two years. And we're having reached an, an interesting moment, um, a crucial moment here of redefining European sovereignty in these topics. Um, the second element that's in this is that the coronavirus crisis has really brought the topic home to people in Europe. And that's also something that we haven't witnessed before. It's a real life experience of how globalization has an impact on your life and its challenges and threats to the supply chain, especially in the technology sector um, and the related vulnerabilities. We haven't seen massive um, kind of disruptions of the technology supply chain over the coronavirus crisis. That has not been the case. But if it had been going on longer in China, then we would have seen massive disruptions in the tech supply chain. I think that's important to underline that due to the fact that China has recovered relatively quickly and has been good at shutting it down, um, the disruption was relatively minimal, but it could have had a devastating effect. Simultaneously, the Chinese behavior all through the crisis has been extremely unfavorable. Um, domestic human rights violations are one area, but the bullying of the, uh, of the diplomacy at the moment and medical equipment blackmail has demonstrated that it is problematic to have an actor like this in such a dominant position, especially in technology sectors. What I've been telling, um, for example, German parliamentarians often is that we were lucky that China was cutting us off from masks and PPE, you know, because it's a trivial product. We can produce it here, we can reshore that, we can find other ways and other avenues. If China is in a position to cut us off from something like semiconductors at some point, or other advanced technologies, then we're in trouble. So I think this is what hit home and where it really became clear how this is problematic. The crisis has severely damaged China's reputation and image, um, and that has had an effect on European of the European consensus. And that's an interesting dimension of this. We can see in our research um, that we have recently have a quite rapid change within European countries when it comes to the assessment of the China challenge, and when it comes to kind of the the the, the threat perceptions and the willingness to engage, especially in Eastern Europe and the Baltics, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Lithuania being prime examples here. And I think that's interesting to see because a negative outside effect has had a unifying effect on the inside of the European Union. Um, so this new enhanced consensus on China provides a window of opportunity for rethinking our engagement, especially on technology questions and the dependence and ethical considerations that come with technologies, especially facial recognition, artificial intelligence, etc. I think the naivete that Europeans had in their collaboration with China on these issues from research and innovation to um, like commercial, uh, the commercial relationship is gone. And now we have to see what we can rebuild on top of that. What does it mean for Europe's ability to kind of actually position itself in these areas? In terms of closing, I would say five, five areas are important. Um, we have to work in Europe on our, the defense of our industrial and technological capacities that we currently have. Um, I think the FDI screening mechanism that was introduced and will come into force in five days and the white paper on foreign subsidies are first steps in that direction from the Brussels end, but this will have to obviously be implemented on the member states level. 
The second element to this is to have an ambitious industrial strategy, despite the disruptions that COVID is um, kind of having at the moment on the European economy, because without an ambitious industrial strategy, there will be no tech capacity in the future. Um, the third element would be to enhance European regulatory power through active engagement with partners, especially in Japan, but also in Australia and India, um, to kind of create alternative, uh, an alternative push for a free flow of data with trust, um, but the, also the ability to forge new coalitions between the two big players in this to avoid kind of to beef up European capacities and to beef up its partnerships. The fourth element is obviously to boost uh, research and innovation funding. It's something that we do not see currently in the MFF. It's not ambitious enough, and I think a lot needs to be done to enhance this. Uh, member states need to put greater emphasis on this, um, and we need to rethink the way uh, research and innovation cooperation has been structured in the past at university level, etc., when it comes to cooperating with China. Um, innovation is taking place in China. We cannot rule that out. And so the question is, how do we govern that? How do we create the interfaces where we can interact? And the fifth and last point would be to actually implement an effective strategy on AI um, that is more than talk, um, but is actually real action. And I would also refer back to the MFF in that case and say, um, I'm not convinced that the currently uh, 2.2 billion that are allotted to it over seven years will cut it. Um, there's obviously member state funding that is additional to that. But if we compare that to um, the number of uh, the the um, about 5.7 billion that China is spending annually at the moment in non-military related AI, then obviously we need to kind of figure out um, how important this area is for us and how important we want this to be. Um, I know that a cry for more funding is always, you know, the, the one option that you have and then you can say, but my topic is more important or my topic is more important. But I think we can all agree that the future, the tech future of Europe is in the interest um, of everyone. And currently we don't see the necessary funding allotted to it. And I will end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janka. That was that was brilliant um, as a means of, of getting us into into the topic. And um, I think you very, made a very important point by saying that 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 Corona and COVID has really brought the topic, both technology and geopolitics, home. Um, now, personally, I'm not a big fan of, of of this narrative that that COVID was this pivotal moment and everything changes afterwards. But this is really one of those areas where I think we have an increased realization among among the public that these things really matter and that we can't escape for both geopolitics and and the technological um changes um i also very much like that you raised two points that i would love to discuss later on and then maybe the the other two panelists also want to want to talk a little bit about this which is number one divergences in national views i mean we're talking a lot about the eu but of course the eu is made up of 27 member states and it um, especially in a new area where there aren't established you know, formats and procedures and all of that yet, it's really important for the member states to well, formulate the, their, their um, positions and to agree on them. So, so any points on that, um, I think, would be quite, quite useful. And then secondly, also the point about coalitions, international coalitions, which I think is a very important point as well. Um, in the past, we, we were, as Europeans, mostly focused, I think, on the transatlantic coalition, but... but um, given recent changes in, in US politics, but also just changes in geopolitical power in the world, um, make it worth, I think, uh, talking about coalitions with other like-minded member states, uh, sorry, members, um, other like-minded uh, states uh, in the world, Australia, Japan, we, we've mentioned a few. Um, but I wanna come now to, to Eva, Eva Meidel. Um, I'd like to remind you that, that uh, Eva is an MEP, member of the European Parliament, from Bulgaria and a member of the new AI uh, committee in the European Parliament. Um, and I'm very excited to have her with us today. Um, I think Eva Janka gave you a lot of food for thought here and some, some ideas of, of what you could push for in, in the um, AI committee. But, but let's, let's hear from you how you see the, the current situation in Europe um, and what challenges you, you identify and what yeah, AI means means for Europe and the EU um, from your point of view. Over to you, Eva. 
Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for organizing these discussions, uh, both for to ECFR, Sofia Vesa and her team, but also to Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Um, and um, thank you, Ulrike, for um, uh, moderating uh, what I hope will be um, a very interesting uh, discussion. Indeed, I think um, Ayanka put uh, very well uh, the areas where we uh, need to uh, focus in the years to come but i will um pick up on um, um on ulrike's last point where you know i would agree with you that i also don't necessarily want to see everything from the pandemic and covid 19 perspective uh, but as policymakers, uh, we sit in the parliament on the one hand and do legislation and on the other hand we meet with citizens and um, we have seen that over the past couple of months citizens have all lost something whether it's their job uh, whether uh, money have diminished in their bank accounts or they've lost a loved one. Um, plenty of companies uh, have difficulties to survive in some member states. Um, so we have to look that um, apart from a healthcare issue, it has created some uh, very serious uh, economic um, issues for us uh, to deal with and not just for um, the remaining of 2020 but probably for uh, the next couple of years um, as well um, and the reason why I mentioned that is because coming out of a pandemic um, and we are not there yet at all um, or a crisis the most important thing that one should learn from it is the lessons and this leads me to go a little bit back um, during the global economic crisis back in 2007 and 2008, uh, because there are a number of analyses uh, that are a little bit critical of the way the EU actually um, overcame that previous uh, global crisis. Um, and um, in reality, it never uh, returned to its best shape of economic growth. I think we all remember it took more than 10 years uh, to come back to the uh, pre-growth uh, levels um, of the crisis. Um, and some say that actually uh, up until that time, our transatlantic uh, partners, uh, the US scored way better on that. So I think we need to look on to the question why this was uh, the reason. Um, and I think in the previous crisis, there was a central problem in the way the EU is thinking about its investments. And I really hope we do not think about those investments in the same way uh, today. Uh, because even in the pre-crisis period, with comparable size of capital investments for growth between the uh, EU and the US, the Americans put significantly bigger shares in ICT and in technologies. And as a result, when um, the crisis hit, they could rely on a higher growth of the GDP created by that sector. Uh, because the ICT uh, drives the productivity rate in all other sectors actually so many analyses show that it is not so much the jobs uh, not so much the investments is the productivity that matters when it comes to the economic growth and it is unfortunately uh, it's something that is kind of the Healy's um, um, heel for, um, for 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 the EU in a way um, I think that over the past couple of years, we've missed already several opportunities when it comes to digitalizing um, our economy. And here, um, indeed, it is very important that we get the next wave of digitalizing our economy, and particularly our industry right uh, that this industry strategy is indeed ambitious and it is indeed uh, embraced by uh, all national views strategy um, and so um, that would be a, a, a good first step um, secondly I think it is um, solutions like uh, AI and data uh, that could provide further a uh, breakthrough for this to happen uh, it gives us a chance to be uh, in a way back in the global digital competition having in mind that in the same time Europe produces huge amounts of industrial data. Um, we uh, have 
had an insufficient long-term labor productivity growth for less than 1% of, of uh, a year. So as we know, it determines that the rate at which wages and living standards um, can rise, but also the scope of social spending and government investment. So this is to a large extent the set of expectations that the European uh, citizens also have for the EU. And I think um, artificial intelligence could be in its deployment part of the solution for Europe's biggest economic challenge and its productivity um, growth. Um, here, of course, we have to also, as um, a point also pinpointed by, um, by Janka, uh, the R&D uh, funding. I mean, <laughs> nothing happens because we put and we decide to say AI is, the, is where we need to invest. I mean, it is where we need to invest, but we need to do it in a very smart way. We have to make sure and provide um, that um, there are certain synergies built in between not just the researchers, but also the people that have to develop it, the people that have to implement it, and finally the end user, uh, to put it in very uh, simplistic um, uh, terms. Um, because after all, uh, the deployment of AI could lead to an increase of the gross value added in countries like Spain, for example, with about 160 billion uh, euro, or Sweden with more than 200 billion euro a year. Um, and this is extremely important, um, having been hit, especially countries like Spain, extremely hardly hit uh, by uh, the current uh, pandemic and, and, and its economy. Um, in a way, uh, AI has the true potential and its deployment in the right way to double the EU any annual uh, economic uh, growth rates uh, and also boost the economic productivity by up to 40% by 2035, uh, while in the same time uh, making uh, people and enabling them to have more efficient uh, use of their time. Uh, but underlying principle of deploying this sort of technologies is the trust that society also has in them. So we might be uh, discussing today and understanding uh, the challenges and how to address them. Uh, but there's an aspect of the society um, seeing the purpose of why those investments should be done, because most of the time this is only when those national views and national decisions are able to act upon and to realize those big investments and big projects in that field because they know they're backed by society. Uh, and in a way, it's, um, it's a chicken and an egg problem because if society is not convinced, there's maybe no one who could convince society because policymakers think it's too difficult to convince society that this is where we have to be uh, investing. And other policymakers are also waiting for society to see this as something that has to be uh, pushed forward. Um, and I say this because um, we have seen in the past that investment has been undermined in the sector. And if we do this mistake one more time, uh, we are going to be way less resilient to whatever sort of crisis is coming. Um, our way. Um, and in a way, I think um, it is good to learn both on the medical side of how to prevent pandemics or other sort of similar situation, but it's extremely important uh, to have already learned from the previous economic crisis where we need to invest. And it's perhaps about time that we put um, our money where our mouth is and have these cutting edge projects in Europe uh, that would, you know, not necessarily aim us into breaking companies that already exist, but making sure we create the right environment that similar, bigger or effective and efficient companies start to exist in Europe. And in, indeed, in a way to do that could be uh, through more um, geopolitical um, cooperation with other partners that we have perhaps uh, explored less in that field uh, in the past. Um, so in, to, to sum it up, I really also hope that the European Parliament will be able to shift the discussion when it comes to the deployment of new technology and the economic potential of AI in the right way. Um, this is why we have the special committee on artificial intelligence in the digital way. Um, we need to see what the companies see in AI. What do they uh, need to start using it? 
state, what are the societal fears and limitations for this. So within the committee, we would like to explore this. Um, for me, at this point, it's clear that um, smaller businesses do uh, lack understanding of what uh, AI might uh, bring for them. They also lack the access to data. They, uh, they very often um, lack the access to technology, but also to talent. Um, this could be overcome with good um, ecosystems where they can find, for example, uh, what they need, uh, what is the potential, um, exchange know-how, and so on. Um, and I think as policymakers, uh, we should take the time into uh, this uh, equation where the lack of trust still exists uh, into new technologies. Um, there's the fear for jobs and professions and so on, and try to find and provide certain solutions uh, because uh, the implementation of the AI strategy um, has to be not just more ambitious in terms of um, money, but it also has to be uh, very uh, swiftly and quickly uh, done. And this does not mean we necessarily need new legislation today, but we should be preparing the ground if such legislation that could enable innovation in Europe is necessary. So the purpose of the committee would be to do its exploration work and in a couple of months come up with a little bit more concrete solution for this next wave of uh, technological revolution and perhaps um, um, regulation in that field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Um, I thought that was that was extremely useful and I and I think it's a very it's very important that you emphasize the importance of bringing in the citizens, right? Um, bringing in society, making sure citizens and, and the general public trusts um, uh, all, all, all these, these new technologies, because I think this is, this is really a topic where um, political opinion and the buy-in of society really is, is quite important. But at the same time, of course, we're talking about you know, very complex technologies. And I, I keep thinking that maybe some element of, um, I don't know whether you want to call it public education, um, but but something along those lines is actually um, is actually needed because I mean even as, as experts I think we we keep learning um, about the different challenges and and technological um, so so I think that's that's a very good point and um, I may come back depending on on on, on how much time we have left in the Q and A's about um, I mean number one you you pointed out the, the work of the, the IDA, the new IDA committee, AI in, in the digital age. And I would love to hear a bit more about what do you think the committee can really can really do and how it how it works. And I'm sure there are other questions along those lines um, as well. And then I think you made a very important point um, with this little jab about um, maybe not breaking up companies, because there really is the question of like, what does digital sovereignty mean? Is should should Europe's or the EU's focus be on primarily US tech giants and how to deal with them, or should it be on creating our own companies, which you alluded to? Um, I think this is also a question that I'd, I'd, I'd love to discuss um, later on. But I want to turn to, to Eileen um, uh, now, who is uh, from the Center for Data Innovation. And Eileen, I think you've gotten a lot of food for thought here already from the two um, speakers. So, so um, I'd be really interested in how you see this, and especially we just had the the Brussels MEP view. So, so what's the Brussels experts view? Uh, thank you, Ulrike. I'm very humble to join this chat. And you're right that you're reading my mind. I got a lot of food for thought. Uh, thanks to Yonka and, and Eva. And, and I would love to hear more about Ada as well. Um, but I'll stick to my points. Uh, and I'm happy to share what I know specifically on the on the EU's AI position and how I see it hopefully with, with some uh, thought-provoking bits uh, in there. Uh, but so to start with, who will win the, the AI global race remains a to-be-continued story, right? Although it's pretty much being, it's about, you know, it's, it's led by the US and China and the gap is, it seems to be widening with the EU. Uh, but meanwhile, the, the policy conversation in Europe and increasingly elsewhere, it's uh, really sparking a race to AI regulation. Uh, because the, con the, the question to, that's being raised is, you know, will the winner of the AI race be the one that first writes its rules? And the EU's response to that question seems to be yes. And Yonka, you said the EU is being pushed around, but I feel that the EU is really trying to push back then here. And the drivers, I definitely agree that it's the EU seeing itself caught between China and the US and digital sovereignty or tech sovereignty is seen as a way to exist within that space. And that's done, uh, you know, by increasing domestic control over 
technology and foreign platforms. So Europe's, you know, positioning itself clearly around that narrative and it's become nuclear among policymakers and it's really behind this sort of a push to, to from the EU to want to leverage its market and regulatory power and some call it the, the Brussels effect and the way it's done is by rolling out a toolbox of strategies and policies to uh, like I said emer regulate emerging technologies and, and tech platforms you see that with the AI legal framework but also with the new rules and competition policy targeted at certain tech companies the data strategy and this industrial data grab uh, data protection assertiveness digital tax and even potentially through the creation of a EU digital ID. But I'll talk about the, um, the EU's AI positioning and approach and its challenges a bit more in depth because that's one of the files on the table that really illustrates the narrative best. And it's interesting first to know that anyway, many countries are building regulatory pressure uh, when it comes to the use of AI. So that, that's not just an EU trend, but a lot of those countries are still taking a wait and see approach in comparison. Now there's lots of um, examples reflecting AI nationalism, that is government increasingly planning to scrutinize the acquisition of AI companies or possibly blocking takeovers um, of foreign companies um, taking over AI companies, but also robotics and semiconductors companies. You see those rules in, in the UK and in Germany. But back to the EU level approach, um, the EU decides to race ahead to create rules for AI. It believes it will enable it to lead in AI and enforce its principles. But there are various concerns uh, that point to the fact that it, you know, if, if we're racing, we're doing that with handcuffs, because the way the proposal of the Commission stands now, many see it as problematic and as something that would discourage firms from pursuing AI. So to name a few, you would have requirements on AI systems based on ethical principles that may not always be realistic uh, or relevant to all AI systems. Uh, you'd have liability extended on, on developers and producers while maybe current rules are sometimes fit for purpose. You'd have conformity control mechanisms to test AI before they're introduced, those systems are introduced to market. And some see that as very onerous potentially and uh, counterproductive. Uh, there's also a proposal to limit the use of some uh, so-called high-risk AI applications uh, that may in turn limit our ability to experiment and improve the accuracy of those technologies and as a result the risk is that we'll be ceding the markets to competitors. So there's really I think a struggle to strike the right balance between hard rules and guiding principles while at the same time focusing on our critical need to reevaluate re Europe's competitiveness. Uh, and there's really a need to solve this gap between the speed of technology and the speed of regulation. The GDPR took 10 years to uh, implement. Do we have that time? Um, and the EU is very much focused on, you know, looking at things through a precautionary uh, lens, uh, looking at theoretical risks rather than maybe, the, you know, focusing the discussion on, on the opportunities. Uh, and there's an idea in my view that there's a, those proposals give the impression that trust in AI and AI uptake can only be achieved through regulation and more certification. And on the whole, that thinking has generated a, ge a regulatory system that mm, risks making European industry less competitive. So there's been some that have alerted to that. Um, now the EU hasn't hasn't been yet able to solve a few challenges here, you know, nurturing data driven business models through a true large consumer domestic market. There's still divergence in IP rules in licensing agreements. Uh, there's also a problem of a lack of financing of existing innovations and VC investment, uh, maybe a lack of digital entrepreneurship skills. Uh, business software investment is much higher in the US, which is attractive for startups. Um, and the UN, I think we would risk, you know, wasting our efforts if we sideline other priorities like those ones, but also interoperability and common standards, which is crucial for better data sharing. Uh, the much needed adoption of AI by uh, our businesses. We have only 42% of Euro European companies that use at least one AI technologies and 85% in China. There's also issues related to the fact that our PhDs, we train them, but they leave. Uh, we attract a small share of international AI talent. We have a lack of human capital supply, a lack of digital literacy. Uh, and finally, it would, be, it would be worth addressing this thing of, of the AI raised by, by seeking alliances with like-minded partners and, and other democracies. If we want to 
to see our values and principles superseding China's in the global race. So it makes sense also when you look at competitiveness, um, because the EU and, and its partners have a history of working together on many innovation opportunities. So there's complementarity there uh, and also a chance to converge around AI regulations and standards. So of course, the EU could push its case um, for creating international rules for AI. Uh, the, the background narrative of digital sovereignty, though, the global race for AI will be won by those that really can best innovate and adopt the technology and not those that are acting in isolation. So I think Europe alone will not do. Uh, and I'd like to mention, before I finish, some interesting developments moving forward. Uh, because the, the Commission's approach is, is, is quite controversial when it comes to AI, although some member states collide on the objective of tech sovereignty overall and on a more interventionist approach uh, on many tech issues. And I think Ulrike, you refer to the Dutch and the French colliding on that uh, just recently. Uh, but last week we've seen a declaration, which is a non-paper signed by 14 countries that urged the commission to, um, to turn to soft law solutions like self-regulation, you know, these kinds of voluntary practices, voluntary labeling and standardization process as a supplement to existing uh, legislation because the issue would be those conformity and assessments I mentioned would risk categorizing too much AI as a serious risk and you would that would provide a static picture of the sectors and applications where AI has been developed so far, but we cannot anticipate easily all the time uh, in the development phase how an AI system could be used later or further develop. Then also the members of the German Bundestag passed a motion last month that said oh, Brussels should strike a balance between you know, mitigating the risks of AI and the rules and efforts to promote innovation and the tech industry. So really trying to ask Brussels to keep its regulatory urge under control. But back again in the idea of mentioning those divisions, in June, the German government, which is not a signatory to the non-paper I mentioned, suggested the commission goes further because it wouldn't be enough to only restrict high risk AI applications so that they would want the rules to cover more. And meanwhile, in the global picture background of this, there's lots of other proposals. We might talk about the GPAI, bilateral agreements happening like between the US and the UK on AI R&D. So it's really here the US trying to get into the cockpit of things when it comes to global AI governance. There's also the Council of Europe, uh, you know, that's talking uh, and that might lead to an international binding treaty regulating AI. So against this background and competing options, a question to address might be, um, you know, how what will be the implications of all that for the EU's own approach and push for regulatory leadership? And final comment, but I have to add it because of something Yanka said that I thought was interesting is on the decoupling. What does that mean? Recently, I've had interesting discussions, a bit more technical, about the TCP IP protocol. And, you know, Commissioner Breton said if the Chinese and the Russians are localizing their data and, you know, storing their data on their territory, then we should do it. There's this uh, European Parliament think tank report that mentioned the EU should build a Chinese firewall. So I'm wondering whether what we're trying to do here is not to build our own internet by maybe coming up with another protocol. Uh, and when you look at the proposal, I think it was on the digital strategy, the next generation internet, no one paid attention to that, those three words. But that, I, I wonder if that isn't the bigger project behind it. So uh, I'll leave it to that. Thank you so much for bearing with me. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Eileen. I thought that was that was brilliant. Um, and I and I love the term AI regulation race because we we keep talking about the AI race, right? But but I think there is indeed some kind of AI regulation race on as well. Um, and this one, the EU is leading at least rhetorically. However, um, there are so many proposals for regulation or, or or standards coming out of you know China and the US as well that that I think it's it's really worth pointing out that that there is also quite a lot of work being done um, on regulation in, in other places. Mm -hmm.